Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last day of uh, the Alaska's virtual disability pride celebration, celebrating dis disability pride and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, this has been a week of promoting the message of honoring every person's uniqueness and differing abilities as a beautiful part of human diversity. We're really excited to have a whole host of guests today. We'll be going for the next two hours. Today, um, our, our first guest is going to be Temple Grandin, and she's going to be interviewed by Jenna Crafton. Following that, we're going to hear Eric Hauk from Portugal the Man. We're going to have some Disability Pride Awards and live musicians and performances from Hannah Yoder, Kat Moore, and The Forest That Never Speaks. And I'm going to be doing a couple songs too. Um, you can see the lineups and the times for today's, uh, for today's presentations, and you can do that by clicking on About right below the photograph that's on this event, pa event page. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker and interviewer. Temple Grandin is a prominent author, advocate, and speaker on both autism and animal behavior. She is well known for her work consulting on both livestock handling equipment, design, and animal welfare. Temple promotes acknowledging differently abled individuals and education that recognizes and accommodates different kinds of minds. Alaskan interviewers are Jenna Crafton and her father Tom is there with her. Jenna will be co-hosting with me later today and I just want to let you know that Jenna is a council member of the Governor's Council on Disabilities and Special Education. She's a LEND fellow and she spent seven years sailing around the world visiting 23 countries that relied that forced her to rely on her strength and me, and she also met a lot of people from a lot of walks of life so without further discussion let's turn it over to jenna crafton and she's going to interview temple thanks jacy terry hi uh temple it's nice to meet you good to meet you uh, <laughs> How did you overcome some of your challenges? Well, I had some very good teachers. My mother was always pushing me to do new things. Uh, my ability in art was um, encouraged when I was very young. Um, that was very helpful. I think it's important to develop a person's strengths. Um, I really like what Stephen Hawking says about disability. Concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. And he said that during an interview at the New York Times. Um, I'm a visual thinker, and I could use um, visual thinking uh, in the work, you know, I've done, done a livestock equipment design. Um, I had some very good mentors. I was not a good student in high school. I got bullied, and the only places I was not bullied was friends who shared interests, things like electronics or riding horses, or maybe for another kid it's robotics, or it's art, or it's music. Uh, dance, cooking, sewing, uh, it could be uh, many different things. And I had a great science teacher and he gave me interesting projects. And what got me interested in studying in school is school had to go from just studying for the sake of grades to studying as a pathway to becoming a scientist. It had to become a pathway to a goal in the future. Yeah. Um, next question is, Do you have fears you had overcome? Do I have what did I overcome? Do you have fears you had to overcome? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand what fields is. Fears. Any fears. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I um, had a lot of problems with anxiety. Um, so I went through my 20s, my anxiety got worse and worse and worse and worse. And I eventually had to treat uh, my anxiety with um, antidepressant medication. Been on it for years. I talk about my issues with anxiety in my book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. And for years, since 1980, I've been taking a low dose of antidepressants, an old fashioned tricyclic. It's fully explained in Thinking in Pictures. Even though it's old, it is still accurate. And um, I. I don't think I'd be here now without the antidepressants because it stopped the constant fear 
And I also had a lot of stress-related health problems, colitis, and that mostly cleared up after I went on the antidepressants. Uh, another thing that's really helps me is I do some vigorous exercise every single day. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing like a hundred modified push-ups every day. And it took me about six months to work up to that. You've got to work up to that really slowly. Um, the other thing is you got to just get out and do things. I'm seeing too many kids where they're getting too overprotected and they're not learning basic skills like shopping, for example. Um, um, I was reading an in interesting um, article about Stevie Wonder, you know, he was blind. And when he was a little kid, he was climbing trees. <laughs> well, I think that's good. That's something that he, he could do totally by feel. But there might be some parents that they say, well, we can't let little Stevie uh, climb trees because he's blind. Well, that doesn't affect climbing trees. That can totally be done by feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got to get kids out doing things. I'm seeing too many smart kids getting addicted to video games and they're not becoming programmers. Um, one of the worst things some of the schools have done is taking out all the hands-on classes, cooking, sewing, art, theater, woodworking, auto shop, welding. Because if the way I got interested in my career in the cattle industry is I got exposed to the cattle industry when I was a teenager. Hadn't been exposed to it, I would not have gone into it. You, you, you try new things, then you find, is this something I'm going to like or is it something I'm going to hate? But you don't know until you try it. Yeah, that's, that's a good point because you want to have more active with people in school to learn how to cook and they want the, the, the kids uh, with disabilities want to have people live on their own and stop cooking. They can't stop cooking when they, nobody can teach Well, them. the problem is there's academic skills are really important, but the other big problem I'm seeing is not teaching enough uh, working skills. And working skills are different than academic skills. You gotta be there on time. You've got to do what the boss tells you. Uh, it's a different skill. And, and too many kids aren't learning things like bank account. I was just talking to a student now, is at a community college and she's learning on you know, very basic business things like accounting. Um, I think some of that stuff ought to be taught in high school. I agree too that we should put it back in the school and and have people have well I've worked with building I've worked with building trades for years so I've designed livestock facilities for major meat companies such as Cargill and Tyson and I've worked with um, people that build these things because I would sell a job and then the way I sold my work is I would simply show my drawings off when people saw my drawings they'd go well, here, I'll show you my drawings. I got to get the picture over here so I know I'm showing it right. So I would show my drawings off to people. And when I showed people my drawings, I got respect. And then I'd supervise construction. And I worked with a lot of very skilled machinery designers and welders. They'd be special ed kids today. I'm going to estimate that 20% of them would have been autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. Mm -hmm. And they were not the good students in school. And I know of two people who own metal fabrication companies and they, it, their high school welding class just saved them. Now I want to emphasize it's not for everybody, but I'm a visual thinker who thinks in pictures. So my kind of mind's either going to go into, the, into, the, into an art career or into what's called industrial design. It's the visual side of doing engineering. I have some more questions. What are your strengths and how did you use them? Well, one of my big strengths is, is visual thinking. In fact, there's evidence now, there's different ways to think. Some people are mathematical mind. Some people are a word mind. Other people are more of a visual mind. Now the mathematicians, you've got a kid that's good at math, we need to be developing that. Um, there might be a kid who could be really good at computer programming, but he's not gonna go into that field if nobody exposes them to it. And people don't think to expose them. And it's not even expensive. You can buy the books online. There's a lot of free lessons online for all kinds of computer stuff. If people just think to look it up. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do programming, but I know how to find the stuff online. 
or go into the store and get or, or buy a book on Amazon uh, on JavaScript or Python or you know one of the um, major computer languages. Who empowered you? Who told told you? Who told and taught you that you can? Who taught you I am? How did they empower you? Well, my mother was always, uh, she had a really good sense of how to stretch me. Always giving me choices, but stretch just outside the comfort zone. Not forcing me into something where it would be sensory overload or something bad, but always, uh, always stretching. And um, then when I did those big projects that were shown in the movie, and all the work stuff in the movie is accurate, and the most accurate part of the movie is how it shows my visual thinking. And I was highly motivated in my 20s. I wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. And that motivated me to work on those projects. How did we overpower others? How do we? How do we empower others? Well, I always try to encourage um, um, students or anyone that find out something you're good at mm. and, and turn that into a skill that other people are going to want. I, and I learned very early on, you know, to, to sell my work. I got one in for an interview. I just laid the drawings out and the pictures out and, and show them that. Or if it's writing, you can show them out. If it's computer programming, you'd show them some of that. Um, we've got to start looking at what people can do. You see, I'm not abstract in my thinking since I'm a visual thinker. I talk about a programmer. I've visited one of the big tech companies. I'm seeing a room full of programmers right now. I, I go somewhere else. So they're doing a whole bunch of graphic design and making um, movies that we really like. You see, it's not abstract. You know, so I'm seeing specific examples of, you know, people doing really well. Who are your role models? How did they impact you? Well, there were some really good uh, professors and good people in the building contracting business who actually seeked me out. And um, the, when it comes to the professors, I first met them at the scientific meeting and I go, oh, well, I wanna be able to do things like Ron Kilgore. That was a professor I, I saw when I was in my 20s. Um, you know, people like that would be, would be a role model. Well, you able to use parts of autism to see and thinking like the cattle? Well, being an extreme visual thinker, that is more like the cattle because animals are a sensory based thinker. They don't think in language. It's sensory based. In fact, I talk about this in another one of my books, uh, Animals in Translation. I talk about how being a visual thinker and autistic on um, helped with uh, helping with, with animals. See, when I first started out in my 20s, I didn't, I thought everybody was a visual thinker. I didn't realize that there were people that were verbal thinkers and they don't think in pictures at all. You know, and then I didn't really fully understand that until I got my late 30s and my 40s. And I'm still, you know, learning about that. So it was obvious to me to look at what cattle were seeing. And I couldn't figure out why it wasn't obvious to other people. Well, if you're not a visual thinker, then you don't see that maybe the animal doesn't want to walk over the sunbeam. Uh, my friend Rebecca Alley raises alpacas and have a shop where she sells her weavings and spun products. She wanted me to ask you ideas you would have and working with skilling skittish. skittish animals. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, alpacas can get frightened very easily. And they're especially going to get frightened when they suddenly go into a situation where there's something new. Because people will say to me, well, my animal is fine at home. I took it to a show and it went crazy. But mm -hmm. you've got a lot of new things there that you don't have at home, like maybe bicycles, flags. So what you want to do is get your animal used to different people touching it. And one of the best ways to train your animal to tolerate flags would be to decorate the pasture with flags 
and let that animal voluntarily come up to it. Don't push a flag in his face. That's the worst thing you could do. Let that animal's curiosity bring it up to a flag. In fact, well, I've always got a lot of books. This is my book on handling livestock here, Temple Brandon's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. But uh, what you want to do with a skittish animal is get them used to different people, different vehicles. Um, let's say you've got a four-wheeler quad bike. Uh, first of all, just park it and let them walk up to it and look at it. Then move it around really, you know, slowly. Don't shove it in their face. It's really important that an animal's first experience with something new like a quad bike is a good first experience. Like you come out and feed them. You don't want a bad first experience where you came out and you chased them with the quad bike because then they're going to be afraid of that bike. You know, make sure that it, it's um, something good happens. And, and then you get your pack, alpacas used to enough different stuff, like different vehicles, different people touching them, all kinds of different things. The other thing you got to realize is that an animal uh, is a visual thinker. So uh, a bicycle looks different sideways than it does frontways. So think about this stapler. You see what that looks like? Now, when I turn it, you see how it looks like a different object. Mm -hmm. So when you are introducing an animal to something new, let's just say a, a chair, show them all sides of it. One of my students, uh, Megan Corgan, just finished a project with a horse and she trained a, a young colts to walk past a child's plastic play set. And, uh, and, and they got to where they didn't react at all to the play set. Now when the play set got turned 90 degrees, it turned into a new object. Because think about it, the slide looks different this way than it does this way mm -hmm. on the children's play set. You see, it's sensory-based. It's not word-based. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wondered if you would share with the audience, I'm familiar with the story behind the title of Oliver Sacks' book, Anthropologist on Mars. Um, and I, I wonder if you'd share the story of that um, with the audience a little bit of how you came up with that term and what that meant to you. Um, I found that just a compelling story of your, your strength and your hard work. You didn't quit. <laughs> well, Oliver Sacks um, uh, interviewed me uh, for his book, Anthropologist on Mars. Uh, the uh, interview originally appeared in the New Yorker magazine about a year before his book came out. And I just said to Oliver, you know, when it came to sort of deciphering some human social things, <laughs> I, I felt like an anthropologist on Mars. <laughs> and that's where the title came from. Because right. for me, it's like, I get, I get really interested in geeky sort of things. Like I've had a chance to do some talks at NASA. Oh man, I got a chance to go down to Cape Canaveral. <laughs> that was like the funnest thing I ever did. Total. <laughs> you see, that's the sort of stuff I find really interesting. And and uh, see, a brain can be either more thinking or a brain can be more social. I think a certain amount of autism is just normal variation. You see, it's a continuous trait. It's not like you have tuberculosis, you've either got it or you don't have it, or COVID, you've either got it or you don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it's continuous. Yeah. Now, it w was part of that story that you used to analyze videos and looking at human, the nuances of, I think there was an example of a cocktail party. You would sort of analyze the video and remember what people did and how they Well, yeah, interacted. I can play the video back in my mind. I remember one time uh -huh. I was on a plane. I was in a window seat. And there was a boyfriend and a girlfriend. And they were doing like googly eyes to, the, to each other during the whole entire flight. And there was very, very little conversation. But boy, they were really enjoying it. And I'm just sitting there kind of watching that like the anthropologist on Mars. <laughs> Another yeah. meeting, another time I remember dinner party where it was some uh, sales reps for a cattle pharmaceutical company. And they, there was two hours of chit chat jokes, uh, very little content, you know, like chit chat jokes about sports, but they didn't discuss like, well, did this coach have good strategy or something like that. And they were having the greatest time and I got bored with it. You know, it's just sports themed chit chat. Uh -huh. Never forget that that party. Uh -huh. They were having the best time. Uh -huh. it, uh -huh. And there was no information. <laughs> you would have like, dated when, me, when you were telling me about sailing in the different countries and what, and what you did on the sailboat, that's interesting to me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's interesting. 
I use my my strengths might be different because my dad said I am a social genius because I love meeting people and I did that all over the world. Okay, well, good. Well, you say different people are different. Yeah, I mean, she uses that to connect with people that then help her navigate this complex world. And I think that's just brilliant. You know, it's just brilliant. And like you said, our different types of intelligence. Well, that's right. You know? Yeah. And, uh, in fact, I've discussed uh, different kinds of thinking in another book I've done, The Autistic Brain, and I'm an object visualizer. And the movie shows exactly how I think. Then you have the more mathematical visual spatial thinker where they don't think in pictures. They think in patterns. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy, Gardner, he thought we had seven types of intelligence. Yeah, and then they have, yeah. they have other okay. things like, you know, kinesthetic and, and uh, some of the other things. Mm. Mm. And different people are kind of, you know, mixtures of these things. But one thing has been learned in the research on the visual thinking, the object visualizer like me, or the much more mathematical kind of mind, you're not going to find a person who's a super genius in both the thinking and pictures and the mathematical. <laughs> They're like opposite. <laughs> and and that's what the uh, research has shown. Yeah. Yeah. What else would you like to know? Uh, would, would, what would you like to share with us that we didn't not to get to? Not to get to? Sorry, I don't understand. I don't hear that well. Oh. I don't hear that very well. I've got some auditory processing and I've gone deaf on one side. So. Okay, uh, let me say it again. I don't mind. Okay. What would you like to share with us that we did not get to? Well, I just want to see people get out there and be everything they can be. I've, uh, I've had a lot of graduate students. I've mentored a lot of students. One thing I tell a lot of students, uh, try on careers. You know, mm. education is getting more and more expensive these days. Uh, you want to be a veterinarian? Well, then go try it on. Find out whether you love it. Maybe you don't like it. You know, it's, uh, 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 if you're in college, do internships. Because you want to make sure you go into a career you're actually going to like. And it's equally important to find out what you don't like. I was reading an interesting um, article about Oprah Winfrey and uh, she was anchoring a local TV station. She hated it. She wanted to, uh, you know, do the talk show stuff. But she said it was, it was really good to make sure she learned stuff that she did not like. Mm. No, I just want to see people get out there and, and do, you know, everything that they can do. And, and, one of the things that was a big barrier for me in the 70s was being a woman. A woman in the cattle industry in the early 70s, that was a very big barrier, probably a bigger barrier than autism was. Mm. I got kicked out of a lot of places for being a woman. Wow. No, uh. that actually happened. And there's a scene in there with the bull testicles on my vehicle, that happened. And what I found is the people that were most likely to do that were not the big owners of a feed yard or a meat plant. It was the foreman level, that middle management level. That's where just about all the trouble was. And they were threatened by this girl geek coming in on their operation. I'm really sorry that you threatened me. Like, like, born, yeah, that's not right for people to act like that. Well, no, it's not right. It was, it was really bad. And um, all I can say is get out there and, and, and show people the stuff you can do. I mean, one of the things that 25 years in construction has done for me, construction is all about outcomes. You've got to get projects built. You've got to get them done. And we've got to figure out what people can do. And I do see too many parents kind of over coddle where you might have a 16-year-old honor student with autism and he's never gone shopping by himself. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then when I go to a... Uh, uh, autism meaning there's a granddad that discovers he has autism and he had and 
he's got a good job and he had a paper route when he was little. Now I know we don't talk about paper routes anymore. But we've <laughs> got to teach working skills. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's your job. You had three years. I used to work in uh, Meva Times, like in. You used to work in what kind of place? Meva Times. It's like. The best paper? It's Renaissance, like cooking. And I'm a pep cook for chicken. Oh, okay. And and I ain't never been late once. Well, good because being on time for work, and uh, that's years. really important. Real important. And you look very nice today. And being uh, looking really, you know, neat and nice. That's another thing. It's very important for work. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be late. You want to be on time. You want to look nice and that's always right. have a smile. That's right. That's important at work. That's easy for you. Huh? Yeah, it's easy for me. Oh, that's, um, that's really good. Like I dress kind of eccentric. Eccentric's okay, but you know, you don't be dirty and slobby. No, you look mm-hmm. good. <laughs> um, you, you know, I just wanted to say before we close that I studied childhood autism in my undergrad and my graduate work and worked in the field professionally after that for years. And you were somebody very important for obvious reasons. You were important to students, professionals, but you were important to me as a parent. And I didn't understand that until today, as I was thinking about you this week, that you taught us in those years not to quit and what your mom did for you. And as a parent, you helped a lot of us not not quit and to persevere and and to work at what we're good at and not to settle for there were some good mentors when I was, uh, you know, I kind of made my own internship at the Swift Meatpacking Plant in Tolleson, Arizona back in the 70s. And there were some good people there. The plant superintendent told me when I was really down, you've always got to persevere. And the cattle buyer out in the yard said, trouble, it's opportunity and work close. <laughs> and I never forgot that. Uh, but there was a lot of good people in the cattle industry too. There were the bad foremans. But there were other people in, in the cattle industry that actually were really good to me. And they saw my abilities, mm-hmm. especially the owners of the feed yards. Uh-huh. See, that's the empowered part mm-hmm. that's interesting. Huh? It was the foremans that did most of the bad things. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Okay, well, it's been really good to talk to you. It is. I, I, I listen to you all. If we could, I listen to you all day. <laughs> it's really interesting to talk to. Well, it's been good to talk to you today. And it was very interesting talking about sailing around the world. Mm-hmm. And on the whole COVID thing, I've suggested the parents to look up life on the International Space Station because you have to be in a tight, confined area. Well, you'd have the same situation with five people on a sailboat. And you were telling me that once you got on a sailboat, you actually were getting along with people um, better. Yeah. Space is not an issue. Well, there's always a schedule on a sailboat and there's work. And they found on the space station, uh, they're on a schedule. They got to get up. And I found for me, since I have not traveled since March 12th, I got to get up in the morning, get dressed for work, take a shower, be ready eight o'clock every day, get my writing done in the morning when I'm fresh. And I'd, be on a schedule and they've learned that on the space station. And I'm sure that when you were living on that boat sailing around the world, there was a, you had to be on a schedule. There's a lot of work you have to do on a boat. Mm-hmm. A lot and of work. One of the things they do in the space station is there's a midday meal. Everybody eats together. It's a, there's something about breaking bread together that's a healthy <laughs> it's on lifestyle. Their, yes, it is. It's on their schedule, and it's the biggest thing on the schedule. And then they have their exercise time, their work time, and then they have scheduled free time. Um, did they want to ask the group? Yes, Terry. Terry, you want to ask any Facebook live yeah, questions? I think it's that time. Thank you, um, okay. Terry. Thank you, Jenna and Tom. And Jenna and Tom, I hope you'll stay on while we uh, ask some questions from the Facebook audience. All right. Okay, fine. So I'm just going to read them in order. Okay, they're just account- just going to get read to me. Not They're not going to show on the chat board. Right. I'll just read them to you. That's fine. Um, unless you'd prefer because they... No, are- no, I can, I can re- li- listen to you read them. That'll be fine. Okay. So the first one is, 
I'd love to hear some reflection on what it was like to have a movie made about your life. Were you involved in the process, such as consulting with the director and cast? And would you say it depicts your life with accuracy? Well, I had a lot of input with Emily Gerson Sains, who was the producer who originally bought the rights. And she has an autistic kid and she wanted the movie to be really good. Mick Jackson, the director and the writer. And they did a very good time of depicting my visual thinking. That is absolutely accurate. The projects I built are accurate. And the main characters like Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, uh, he was shown very nicely. Yeah, there's some things that they exaggerated that like crazy horse. That was a bit of an exaggeration. But um, I thought they did a beautiful uh, job with the movie and, and the anxiety and the sensory issues that was shown accurately because sensory issues are a real serious problem. And one of the ways to help a kid who's got sensory issues, regardless of the cause, is let the kid control the thing they, that hurts their ears, like the hairdryer or the vacuum cleaner. When they turn it on and off, they might go from hating the vacuum cleaner to loving it when they start controlling it. Thank you for that um, answer. Um, there's another question here. It says, Temple, I too have autism. What has always been your weakness in life? Well, I can't do algebra. I'm visual thinkers can't do algebra, so I couldn't go to engineering school. Um, mm -hmm. uh, algebra is impossible for me. I managed to get out of taking it, and I'm worried that um, a lot of smart visual thinkers are getting screened out because they can't do algebra. And I'm working on some new stuff I'm writing about uh, visual thinking. Um, that it's uh, You've got to work on building up the thing that you can, that you can be good at. Got to, you know, that's what you need to do. Another problem I've got is I don't have very much working memory. So I'll give you a little hint. Don't burden per people with autism, but also some other, other learning differences with long strings of verbal sequential information. I cannot remember it. Anytime there's a task, it has to have steps. I need a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three, to just jog my memory. Because I, I basically have got no working memory. I got tons of long-term memory. Awesome. That's, that's great advice. Thank you for that. Okay. And then the next one is, do you have any pets in your home? Well, I don't have any pets now because I was traveling. Um, now I do get a chance to see other people's pets all the time. And uh, their dogs really like me. I'm, I don't know when we're going to get back traveling again. I'm, I think it's going to be, we're going to have to wait until we get a decent vaccine for COVID. Yep. It's, it's, a, it's a big curiosity to everybody across the world. Well, everybody, I mean, uh, right around the middle of March, just about everything in the U.S. was locked down. Uh, uh, right before spring break, we had a faculty meeting. The campus was closed. We had to get our stuff online, like, instantly. And it's been a learning experience uh, putting classes online. And the yeah. thing I've learned is it seems to work better to put the lectures online and then have like video discussions. And they work a whole lot better than audio discussions do. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, there is a question here, and I'm not sure if, have you made movies? The question is, can you share with us, with us a little bit of what it was like for you to be in front of the camera doing music, doing movies? Well, I've done, when I did my, my very first uh, uh, class when I was in graduate school, I panicked and walked out. And then I learned the thing to do is to have really good slides. And if you panic, the worst thing happens, you read your slides. <laughs> I, Awesome. Okay. And then the next question is, as a visual thinker, is the writing process very different from the drawing processes for drawing process for you? Um, are there parallels between them? Well, basically what I do when I write is I, um, I narrate the pictures in my mind. Now, one of the problems I have as a visual thinker is it's associative thinking. So I've had problems with writing organization. That's one of the reasons why I've got co-writers on some of my books, not all of them. Um, and, to, and to do a better job of organization, I have to make an outline and split it up into, into sections. Now, one of the things that's helped me with writing is uh, when I was in elementary school and junior high, 
the teachers marked up my, my paper and corrected them. I'm finding now with the graduate students who we've gotten in the last five years, that some of them have really bad writing skills. And what I've learned is they never had to write a book report and they never had anybody red mark up the work and correct the grammar. I had that. And so by, even though I was a rotten student, by the time I got the ninth grade, my writing skills were better than, you know, some of the students uh, today. And it has to go back with how they're taught. They got through school without writing term papers and book reports. I think a book report's important because you've got to summarize that book. And then after you summarize it, then critique it. Very good. That's, that's great. That's really helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, Temple. Today we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. What are your hopes and dreams for how we can continue to grow disability rights and access? Well, one of the things that's done at my university is I've had a sign language interpreter in for deaf person. I've had, um, uh, you know, I had to get some braille uh, lessons for another person. Uh, I've been at Colorado State for 30 years as a professor, and I, I don't know, years ago, they made our building accessible. They put in an elevator. These are all things that were done for, uh, you know, students with disabilities. What we've got to do is you always have to keep advocating. You always have to keep advocating. Another thing that I think can be a problem is when we lump all these disabilities together, because the kind of things that a person in a wheelchair needs are very different from maybe a person with a learning disability. I'm, you see, as a visual thinker, I'm much more specific in how I think. Concepts are made with specific examples. When you're a verbal thinker, you have a big, huge umbrella thing to do. I'm, I'm much more strategic in the things that I work on. Yes, I've done a lot of work on improving how animals are handled, but I worked on animal handling for cattle and pigs mainly. I didn't try to do everything to the entire industry. You've got to pick out a, a chunk of something you can put your head around. I, I remember going to a humanities class at a, at a big college and this girl wanted to do social justice. Well, you got to pick out something specific, like, okay, let's say wrongly convicted criminals. See, that'd be something specific. You'll be more effective if, if you target your work on something that's a much more specific thing. Like narrow your focus, for sure. Narrow your focus, not because social justice is so broad. Where, where do you start? Or you look at it and you just get discouraged. Mm -hmm. okay, I got it. Yeah, that's very good advice too. Well, you've, you have very great insight. This is, I'm sure this is meaning a lot to a lot of people. Thank you for this. Um, let's see, the next question is um, Temple. I've read your books and I grew up on a farm and everything you've written about animals and cows, especially, oh, everything you've written about animals and cows, especially they ring true with me and I appreciate you dedicating your life's work to them. I get to work with adults with disabilities and I wonder what advice you can give me to better serve my autistic friends. Well, one of the problems we got with autism is since they changed the criteria and took out Asperger's, you've got such huge spectrum. Because I've been out to Silicon Valley to the major tech companies and a lot of those programmers I know are autistic. And then you have somebody with much more severe, uh, uh, severe challenges. And, and you see, as a visual thinker, it, nothing's abstract to me. And let me just, uh, I saw a very good w artist's workshop that was put together on, on uh, I'm very bad on remembering names. I'm seeing the workshop and they had people with different skill levels making metal flowers and they were selling them online very, very effectively. And each person, you know, contributed to it. Now that's something that's really creative. That's the kind of stuff I like. And it was something that worked really well. Oh, very good. Awesome. Thank you. Any, um, uh, uh, there, I don't see any more questions on here. Did you want to add to that, um, how a person working with uh, people with autism could be better, more effective? Or well, first of all, that's too general. I've got to know the age group. If it's little kids, like three-year-olds, then we got to work on early intervention. And during lockdown with COVID, I, I, that, a therapist isn't going to be able to work over Zoom or Facebook with the, with the child. But what they can do is coach the parent how to do it while watching over the uh, over the internet link. 
Um, you know, kids with autism, you can't be abstract with them. You just sort of, you know, like, they tend to be very rule bound. Um, and you always got to stretch them. There's a tendency to get too comfortable and not want to try something new. You always have to stretch them, but give them choices. Give them choices. We could try this sport or that one, you know, or you could try woodworking or you could try pottery. I mean, I'm just making stuff up, you know, yeah. try, try some different things. There's a tendency sometimes to overprotect on, and, and rather than figuring out what the person can do. The other thing is you need to recognize doors. There's a scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card because I realized if I wrote for that magazine, that could really help my career. These kind of doors are everywhere. And a lot of good jobs, good jobs for everybody are gotten through the back door. This is for everybody, half of all good jobs. But the problem is a lot of people don't see the doors. And I'll talk to parents and I say, well, who do you know that owns a little independent shop? And they go, oh, I don't know. Now, well, well, a florist, you know, whatever. Some little independent store that maybe uh, they could work in and you could just set it up in the neighborhood. And they often don't think to do that. I've talked to parents who are programmers and they didn't think to teach, even try to teach their kid programming. One of the advantages you have with computer stuff is there's no health and safety issues. You're not going to get hurt doing computer programming. And they hadn't even thought to do that. No, we're just going to go to Volk Rehab. You know, that's, that's just one route. But then I get out in the, uh, in the real world. I was out visiting one of the big tech companies, talked to a young man there. And I said, he was from Wisconsin. I said, well, how did you get this job? Well, his professor knew somebody at that company. Yeah, you see, that's, you've got to look for those, those connections and people often don't see them. Very good, that's awesome. Well, I'm looking at the time and I see we probably have time for one more question. Okay, and that's fine. Um, we're good to go, Jenna. Um, after this question, after Temple answers it, then you're gonna be ready to introduce the next act, right? Okay, okay. Temple, yep. this last, great, thanks. The last question is, can you talk about what's changed from your perspective as the world has grown more aware and accepting of autism? Well, there's a lot of things that's improved. I can remember when there was no early intervention programs and I was very lucky to get into good early intervention. I'm, uh, I don't know if I'd be here if I hadn't had really good speech therapy when I was a little kid. You know, there's a lot of things that services that's gotten better and I've traveled all around and I find there's different states or some are better than others. Some schools are better than others. Uh, there's a, just a very big wide range of things. Well, this, this has been, thank you for that answer. And this has been wonderful. And we just hugely appreciate your taking the time to come and speak with us today. And um, Jenna- well, I want to mention one other thing. When I, I should was bullying, when I was in elementary school, I managed to escape getting bullied. And the reason for that is that my third grade teacher explained to the other students that I had a disability, but it wasn't visible like a wheelchair or crutches. And the other kids needed to be helping me. And that's called peer mediated intervention. It's got a fancy name. Then high school was, was horrible with bullying. And the only places I was not bullied was the friends through the shared interests. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's across the board with a lot of people experience bullying. And it's, um, it's definitely something that's being addressed though. I know here in Juneau, we have a lot yeah. of- um, it's, big, it's a big problem. And, uh, but this peer mediated intervention uh, Mrs. Teach said, I managed to get through elementary school without getting bullied. And then high school was, at, was beyond horrible. Mm -hmm. No, I can't imagine. I'm sorry that happened to you. That's, it's not fair to anybody. Well, again, thank you for taking the time. And Jenna, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate uh, you we talking to each other. Uh, I, I really like to listen to you a lot and I wish I could meet you. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Uh, well, at least we're meeting on Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't been doing very much traveling these days. Haven't been doing any. Haven't been on a plane since March 12th. Mm -hmm. That was my last flight. Well, be well, stay safe. 
Yeah, okay, well, thank you so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. Thank you, everybody. And, and, and again, thanks to Temple and thank you to the audience for sending in questions. I'm going to turn it over to Jenna. She's going to introduce our next act. And um, again, thank you, Temple. And, and Okay, well, thank you for having me. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely, uh, good message from Temple Granite. Uh, next act is Eric, Eric Hawk, and he's from Put the Man, and he's a musician. He's a lead musician, and I really enjoyed interviewing him. And he's really a fun and nice guy to get to know in an interview. Enjoy mm -hmm. this video, and they have a song next with him too, singing. You want to know anything about me? I want to know everything about you. Yeah. Um, can you can you tell me where you are right now and who you are and what and what you're doing? I I live in Eagle River. I used to sit, sit, uh, live on a sailboat for 2001 to 2016, 11 years. Wow. And uh, I've been to 25. But for 24 different countries before I was 21. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, it kind of sounds similar to, to my world, except without the boat. I lived on a bus for, for a number of years with my friends, just being in the band. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. That's neat. I think you got more more countries than I do, but uh, yeah, we just drove around drove around the states. We've you know toured Europe, South America, all over Asia, all over the place. I like to call the disability community kind of like it's large but lonely because nobody can completely identify from one person to the next. Even you know I'm a T4 paraplegic, but my story is going to be completely different from any other T4 paraplegic. Have you? Uh, it's 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 a hard thing to explain, but it's I think it's important to have as many conversations and as many perspectives as you can, and just hear, it's all about hearing stories, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mine is um, I have intellectual disability, so I have a hard time speaking sometimes. You get my message across. <laughs> you, you, you're killing it to me, though. You're, you're doing absolutely spectacular. You should be a radio host. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I think I will. I'm an icebreaker. I like go out and meet people. But kind of hard when you're stuck inside and gotta do Zoom. That's 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 all my whole life has been though. It's just like going from place to place, like meeting as many people as you can, playing to big big crowds, and then getting back in the bus and going to the next city and just doing it. And uh, it's a it's it's a lot different, but it's a it's a nice time to kind of be home and, and reflect on on what's important and, mm -hmm. and kind of take all the perspective of all your travel and reduce it and and uh, think think about what you learned and think about the stories you learned, right? Mm -hmm. How you become uh, in the wheelchair? Well, when I was uh, about 13 years ago, when I was 25 years old, I had already been a uh, like I had been a touring rock musician for years and I played in a bunch of different bands. And um, basically while I was kind of doing that, I was also uh, padding my income and like working second jobs. So I was doing construction jobs and all kinds of other stuff. And um, long story short, um, just kind of on, on an off chance, I ended up falling into a uh, like a construction site into a, a hole that was off of the side of a friend's house and it wasn't very far it was uh it, it's kind of crazy i i grew up doing all kinds of crazy things i grew up in alaska so i would jump into lakes jump into rivers you know go climb mountains and jump off those but ultimately like i just kind of fell gently like 12 feet into into a hole but i landed wrong so I severed T4 through T6 and, and got my spine pretty good. Um, but uh, I was I was already playing in, in some pretty big bands at the time. So pretty much right after rehab, after two or three months, I was I was back up and playing shows in the chair. And I kind of had to relearn how to hold the guitar and 
how to use my breath and how to sing, but um, I was just really lucky to be able to go kind of right back and, and start doing my job again. And that was 13 years ago and I'm still doing it. Yeah, you ever feel angry about they put you in a wheelchair or sure. you have bumps in road? I, uh, you get I, frustrated? I, I, of course, of course. And I, I think the more times that you experience a, a, a certain roadblock or, or different difficulties, like the more times that you work through it, the, the easier some of that stuff becomes. Life still throws curveballs at me all the time. You know, like I can, I can be completely defeated by going into a building by like two stairs, you know, like that's, that's it for me. Like I, I'm just not going in there unless someone lifts me in, but um, but I also work really hard to find humor in all of it. I think if you can just like laugh and notice that something's absurd or hilarious or weird, like that makes everything so much easier. <laughs> yeah. With this platform, what do you see yourself as a role model for others? Well, I think the, the, the coolest thing that I can do is, um, just be on be on a stage in front of everyone, and I I, I do my job, and I, you know I I like to talk, and I'm proud of proud of who I am and what I've been able to achieve um, with my circumstances. But I also just go out in front of a thousand people every night and go play the show, and it's not like oh he's like he's up there in a wheelchair. It's hey he's up there in a guitar, you know. Um, so for me, it's just always kind of. I've, I've kind of existed to demonstrate that you can do what I do, even, you know, even in, especially if you're in a chair, like the chair doesn't matter. Mm -mm. Yeah. Do you see yourself in the future helping others? That's, I, that's hopefully, I mean, I would love to be, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the best thing that you can do. And again, it goes back to, I've traveled the world, you've traveled the world. Um, if you don't share those experiences and those stories with anyone else, what's the point? So I think there's a lot of different ways that you can um, help people. And a lot of that can just be to either to understand where they're coming from um, because of your personal experiences uh, or, or showing them that there's, 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 there's other things in the world that are beyond just within the self and within them. So that's, that's kind of my big fight. How did you overcome your challenge? How did you cope with your fears? I am still learning how to overcome my challenges and I'm still learning how to cope with my fears. I don't know that anybody able-bodied or disabled, but especially the disabled, I don't, I, I think we're set up sometimes in a world that's not necessarily built for us. Um, certainly me and, and, and I, certainly anybody that deals with frustration. I think that's where that frustration comes from. And frustration can either lead to let's figure out how to fix it or work with it, or frustration can lead into fear, which just makes you want to run from it. So I've always kind of tried to figure, figure out my frustrations and see if I can figure out a solution um, whenever I can. How did you use your strengths and what are they? <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to, to keep doing what I was doing, fortunately. Um, I, I guess my strengths are uh, I'm a multi-instrumentalist, uh, guitarist, bassist, uh, songwriter, and thankfully I got to sort of weave those, those strengths into, into my life as it was before I got injured and as it is now post injury. Um, so lucky me, like that's, that's spectacular. I don't know that I have a lot of other strengths, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I can, I can juggle a little bit and uh, I guess, uh, I don't know. I think strengths can just be curiosities and hobbies and, and things like that. And I think as long as you're, still curious and you still want to learn you're gonna you're gonna be okay mm -hmm. who are your role models who helped you empower you and told you i can and how 
how did they uh, empower you? I mean, Christopher Reeves is amazing. Um, he's he's kind of the international symbol of overcoming Christopher and Dana Reeve. Um, I mean, I don't think that you can get more um, inspired by what it means to overcome than than that guy. Um, pretty incredible. Um, he the, the, a lot of a lot of the the people that showed me possibility are not. Um, people that you would know, not famous people. My first roommate that I had in the hospital when I was learning how to do rehab um, was an older paraplegic that was, uh, he was in there for, for some other um, health reasons, but um, I was brand new and he had already been in a chair for 20 years at that point. So when the nurses would come in and they would, you know, try and scare me with things and roll me over and poke me and prod me and all that kind of stuff. He would be on the other side of the curtain being like, ah, you don't need to do that. And then they would leave me be like, listen, you're going to be okay. You know, like these sometimes uh, when you're in, in the hospital and in situations like that, they kind of have to scare you a little bit and tell you certain things and stick a thermometer in you and, you know, <laughs> like check your ears and your throat and your nose and your mouth. And he's like, you don't need all that. Um, so I think just having, having role models in your community that, that, um, or even friends in your community that, uh, can help you out in certain situations. That's, that's the most important thing is just a sense of community and people that can, if they don't identify with you, they can at least, sympathize or help in, in different ways. That's, that's the, that's the key. Yeah. How did your challenge affect your music? Did you out outlet allow you to be believing yourself? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm not the world's greatest songwriter, um, but I can play a really good guitar. You know, like I can, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a better musician than I am a, a songwriter or a creator, I think. But um, for the songs that I, I have created, it's, it's, it's been a huge part of it. Um, it's been an enormous therapy just to sort of be able to be creative and to take the thoughts that you have and, and, hopefully come come with a, a, a clearer meaning of what those thoughts are because a lot of, a lot of the time when we're talking about fear and anxiety and and all that um it can just be a cloud it can just be this sort of abstract mood or you know this sort of place of of unsettling you know unhappiness or or however it works and i think when you can get to a situation where you're writing down words and singing out notes you 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 kind of figure out where that's all coming from. So yeah, it's been it's been enormous. It's been huge. Is there anything you would like to add or share? I'm just happy to be here, and I miss Alaska every day. I, my my mom's in Anchorage. You know, my my family's from the Valley and in Fairbanks and Anchorage and all over the place. And so I'm just uh, I'm I'm happy to be connecting with you, and I'm. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm I'm sitting down here in Seattle, Washington. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice cloudy day. It's been way too hot here, um, but wow. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be sitting here with you and connecting with you. And I love how the world has sort of become smaller and larger at the same time with things like this. So it's just, it's great to see you. You want to yeah. play some music? Yeah, I got a song for you guys. I can grab a guitar. Ugh, there we go. Um, let's see what this sounds like. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, let me make a few adjustments. Okay. So I didn't know what, I didn't know what I was going to play, whether it was going to be an original or a, a cover, but I figured I'd, uh, I'd take kind of a personal song. Um, and hopefully it's, it's a little bit of a song for hope and, uh, yeah, I'll just I'll get into it. But thanks for thanks for having me and thanks for listening.
about the only original I got. Uh, that's an oldie for, from where I come from, but um, I just wanted to thank you guys for uh, for letting me talk and uh, maybe make a quick plug for the, uh, the the PTM Foundation that we've been working on. Um, What's the PTM? The PTM Foundation is the, uh, it's a, it's a organization that's set up kind of on behalf of the band and it's, it's designed to, to work with uh, with voices that we feel need to be amplified. So a lot of the times that can be indigenous voices, um, a lot of the times that can be voices of disability, but um, that's a, that's kind of the, 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 the most important work that I've done outside of playing guitar, outside of, of, of talking or, or, you know, doing any of that kind of stuff. It's, 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 fun to, it's fun to do a little bit of work and to get back into, you know, figuring out what's important. Well, that, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, dude. This is really lovely. I really enjoy it. Disability pride. Yay! <laughs> All right, guys. See ya. Great. Well, we're, that was a great interview, Jenna. You're a, you're a natural. You need this. This is a second career for you, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think so I think I will uh, do one more interview in. I really enjoy it. Uh, thanks for Eric did so much. I really enjoy his interview and his music is really good too. I really like his music. Very good. Well, so Jenna, I just um, want to turn it back over to you. You're going to uh, introduce who's next. Sure. So we have in, I'm happy to welcome Hannah Yoda. Yoda. Hannah is the leader of of the Hannah Quota Band, which performs original country, folk, and bluegrass music. The band records several albums. Hannah works with disability people. She has been a DSP at Sydney and Vix, and now, now is now is now the process of becoming a, a care coordinator. Thanks for being with us today, Hannah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm just gonna play a few original songs for you. This one's called All I Need. Um, and if you know it and you wanna sing along, feel free. Thank you. 
Um, I'll play another one off my first album. Do you have two albums on the internet if anybody is interested? This one's called Andy. <laughs> Don't 
for doing that this is wow what a great i've never heard you play before i'm so happy that i got to hear that <laughs> you know do that's really a uh, great music i really enjoy the songs thanks for thank coming you. today thank you you're welcome so great so um uh i guess so Jenna, you're going to introduce who's next maybe who's who's up next uh sure next we have kate moore Kate Musician is inspired by the Alaskan active environment, mm. environment. She is a talented soul musician and also performed with the music group called Super Saturated mm -hmm. Sugar Streams. Kat lives in Anchorage. Thank you for being here, Kat. Hey, thank you. For I, want, I want to make sure we also mention that Kat um, is performing today as the forest that never sleeps. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. And um, thank you so much to Hannah and Jenna for all the awesome interviews, for Terry emceeing as well, and uh, for Eric and Temple and everything we've gotten to see today. It's been so inspiring. Um, this so first song is called Faces. Well, I saw faces in the clouds today, my saving graces, thinking you would stay. I have been longing for days when we won't say goodbye. Still I fear that great big embrace Rainy solitude in the absence of the love you've shown. And so I can never stay. Still, I do not want to hear.
saw faces in the clouds today. <laughs> um, thanks so much for watching, everybody. This is really an honor to be here. Um, this next song is kind of piggybacking off what uh, Eric sang about. It's sort of a gratitude song. Um, it's called Sugar or Salt. Because sometimes in life we experience a little bit of both, you know? But without sugar and salt, you couldn't make a good cookie recipe. So they kind of work hand in hand. Is it sugar or is it salt? Either way, it ain't your fault. Days go by and I wonder when. Oh, I could see your face again. Yeah, I could see your face again. Now I play this old guitar. Someone bashed in your old car. Plastic sheet over the rear. Said, why do we live in a world of fear? Yeah, why do we live in a world of fear? Cause time's been hard Time's been hard On everyone But we keep hanging on Yeah, we keep Well, they say life is bittersweet. Sometimes lemons are what we eat. But I know I'll make it through. As long as I share my table with you. As long as I share my table with you. Yeah, time goes by Bling of an eye And then it's gone But we keep hanging on Yeah, we keep If you're at home and you'd like to sing along or sign along, or even just enjoy and feel the spirit of this, feel free to join. We keep hanging on. We keep hanging on. We keep hanging on to sing our song. One more time. We keep hanging on. We keep hanging on. We keep hanging on. To sing our song. Ah, oh, thanks for singing along and participating in whatever way felt good to you. Um, it's hard. I, I, my computer's to the side, so I can't see you, but I'm looking at you here, but I'm feeling your energy, and it's awesome. <laughs> um, thanks so much again for having me be a part on The Forest That Never Sleeps, and it's a 
such an honor to be in such a cool lineup of amazing human beings today. So thank you so much for sharing that with me and letting me share with you. I've got one more tune, and it's a little bit of a dance tune. It's called Box, and um, it was inspired by a National Geographic program that I watched about mummies and also about love. Pandora's box has come unlocked And now I wade through a sea of confusion And though I'm lost, I'm caught in thought Although my heart suffered a massive contusion There's life after life after life after life, and you should know. Because there's life after life after life after life, and you should know. Well, you held me there in your palm. Sixteen years, it wasn't clear what was really there. And now you ask me to try to stay calm Or tell me now, or just how could that be fair? So let me rest two months and ten Wrap me up from head to toe Won't you wrap me up again? Put me in time to go because I'm gonna need it because there's life after life after life after life and you should know because there's life after life after life after life and you should know because there's life after life, after life, after life, and you should know. Because there's life, after life, after life, after life, because there's life, after life, after life, after life, because there's life, after life, after life, after life, and you should know. Thank you all so much for having me. It's such a treat to be here. Thank you so much for being here, Kat. I really enjoy your music. Oh, thank for being you. Here. I really enjoyed your whole program today. It's been wonderful. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, uh, next, uh, now I introduce my co-host, Terry. Terry is a Juno singer and songwriter who lives in Juno. She had been part of Juno Disability Pride celebrations since they first started three years ago. Many of her songs are about life in Alaska. Terry has both personal and professional experiences with disability. Terry, thank you for helping us this week with Disability Pie. Let's hear some of the music. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jenna. And um, I just also want to make sure we're thanking the two interpreters, Rachel Robeson and Nat Natalie Page. Uh, they are providing uh, sign signing for folks that um, cannot hear, and we really appreciate that. So we've uh, sent them the lyrics to our songs in advance, so uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along with um, the songs to this, to our uh, to our, you'll be able to follow along with our songs. So um, I am going to start with a song that I wrote maybe 40 years ago, uh, and it's I, I kind of consider it my theme song, and um, so I always like to start with it. It's called "Lover of People." I am a lover, a lover of people. One of the things that I like to do most is run into someone that I can be close to. I am a lover, a lover of you. So many times people don't understand me and all they think that I'm trying to put on the squeeze but there's something inside me and I like you to have it so please don't worry because this one's for free Cause I am a lover, lover of people one of the things that I like to do most is run into someone that I can be close to. I am a lover, a lover of you. Oh, 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 Cause these days have been filled with our goodness A new interest of what's inside you My thoughts take me nowhere but into the pleasure Into the pleasure of knowing, knowing you Cause Sure, I wonder, like everyone wonders, what it would be like to spend time with you. But I'm sure the future will come to us anyway. So let's not worry, let's just have today. I'm a lover, a lover of people. One of the things that I like to do most is run into someone that I can be close to. I am a lover, a lover of you. <laughs> so um, that's a song I played on my guitar. Um, the next one I'm going to play on my dulcimer, which you won't see while I'm playing it. But um, it's the song is called Lady of the Chilkoot, and it's one that I also wrote many, many years ago. And it's the true story of a woman who was hiking the Chilkoot Trail back in 1896 or 1892, but uh, late in the 1800s. And uh, the Chilkoot Trail, of course, is down here in Southeast Alaska. And she was hiking with her boyfriend and a whole bunch of other people into the gold fields when an avalanche came down and buried and killed most of the people in this big, huge party of people that were hiking up. Um, the, this woman, her name was Vernie Woodward, she, she found her boyfriend's body in the snow. She pulled him out, she breathed air into his lungs, she shook him, she did what she could to revive him, and he actually survived. And um, this song was written about that story. It's a, I found it in a newspaper written from back then. And again, it's called Lady of the Chilkoot. There's a place on the hill, on the side of the hill. There's a place on the hill where the snow did go. Oh, we go down the hill 
down the side of the hill. Sixty men, it did kill, it did kill. Now all the men were very deep. Now they'd sleep in winter sleep. All the men were very deep. Only some were finally free. A young woman found her man, and she gave all that she had. He was dead, and they all said that he was dead. Oh, the lady of the chill coat during gold rushing time. It was love's perseverance. It was love that saved his life. They could not understand why for three hours she did try. For three hours she did try to bring him back again to life. She breathed warm air into his lungs. She fought with courage and her love. In a while he did respond. He did respond. Oh, the lady of the Chilkoot during gold rushing times. It was love's perseverance. It was love that saved his life. There we go. And the beautiful handmade blue lion dulcimer. Okay, for my last song, let's see how we doing on time. Oh, we've got time. I should talk a little bit, maybe. Um, so I was planning to do one more song, and um, I guess I should say that for many years, I traveled around the state, around Alaska. Um, I've been here since 1976, and in 1980, I was uh, chosen to be part of a, a program that the Arts Council was running back then called Shows to Go, and I got to travel all over and perform form with shows to go and then got picked up with the artists in the schools program so for over 25 years I was uh, that was my sole profession was to travel around and perform uh, and teach music in rural Alaska as well as some of the larger cities too so um, this I, I because I worked in schools I came up with a lot of children's songs that I wrote over the years and I decided to perform this song today it's one of my favorite children's Children's songs that I've written, but I think adults can appreciate it too. It's called the Refrigerator Song. Late at night, when children are in bed, when dreams are dancing inside their heads, listen to them. Boogie woogie music going on. It's the flute dancing to the refrigerator song. Open the ice box and look inside. I see the little sugar cookie jive, jive, jive. Kicking off a frenzy, playing in the lard. Dancing in circles round the mayonnaise jar. Oh, squish, squash, applesauce, pumpkin pie. Coupon, mustard, pumpernickel rye, Limburger, hamburger, mozzarella cheese, salad and alfalfa sprouts and lettuce leaves. Now, pick out a pickle and swing her around. Throw her to the lemon juice, but don't you sit down. Look at the top shelf and check out the dills, cause they've been splashing in the buttermilk. Now, here comes a tomato with her black shoes on. Just shaking a banana to the beat of a drum. Old Miss Jello's gonna marry the soup. You know, I bet their little baby's gonna look like goop. I said, squish, boss, applesauce, pumpkin pie. Poop on mustard, copper, nickel, rye. Limburger, hamburger, mozzarella cheese. Solid and a and lettuce leaves. 
Now chill out, baby. Well, don't you cry. The onions in the corner just are dry in her eyes. Here comes a chili pepper to cheer up. And if that's not enough, here comes a peanut butter cup. I said squish, squash, applesauce, pumpkin pie. Coupon mustard, pumpernickel rye. Limburger, hamburger, mozzarella cheese. Salad and a papa sprouts and lettuce leaves. Solid and alfalfa sprouts and lettuce leaves. Solid and alfalfa sprouts and lettuce leaves. <laughs> well, that's all I had time for. I'm glad we're a little bit early because we have a um, an extra little video we're going to throw in today. And Jenna, you're going to introduce that. I'm going to turn off this computer and get back to the other one. Thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you for Tracy. Uh, great yeah. song. Terry, great songs. I really like it. And the last one, make my tummy hungry. Anybody <laughs> hungry? <laughs> <laughs> So our next performer is, now we have a really short video before our last act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My name is Maggie, I am from Anchorage, Alaska. I love theater and playing basketball. I go to the theater and watch plays. My favorite plays, Beauty and the Beast, The Ark took me to see it. And I play basketball my first year at The Ark. That's how I met my buddy Nate. I have cerebral palsy. I love using my wheelchair because it helps me move. And my Dyna box helps me talk. Disability pride means it's like a family. We go through a lot together. What helped me thrive is being with my friends and family. My role model is Nate from the Ark because he is funny and full of surprises. He even been my staff on my last day of the clubhouse. I was really surprised. My wheelchair almost fell over and Nate rescued me and my friend Sasha. My favorite TV shows are Blue's Clues of You and Camp Laszlo. One of my favorite songs is Oh Where Oh Where Have My Little Dog Gone. I listened to it all of the time when I was in Clubhouse. My self-care advice is talk to your friends and family. I talk to my friends and family sometimes. If I had a superpower, it will be a glowing nose like Rudolph and Zero from Nightmare Before Christmas. To be advocacy means talking about how I feel. I am still on my advocacy journey. It started when our own president made fun of disabilities. It's made me mad, frustrated, and really scared. I am going to do a live speech. In hope in 30 years, normal people and people with disabilities will live in harmony. Just like the animals in Zootopia, I get along with normal people like my family, Nate, and other people. Thanks, Maggie, for the uh, really good video. I really enjoy it. And thank you, Terry, and thank you to everyone who has helped today's celebration honoring the 30th anniversary of the, Dis the Americans with Disability Act. By the way, don't forget to vote. I learned last year at Peer Power that you need to go out and vote because you want to make the world a better place. Now Terry is going to share some thank yous for everyone who ha has helped this week. Thanks, Jenna. And um, I really want to make sure that this happens because um, this whole event, uh, this whole week was planned by a, hu by a, a huge 
a group of passionate and dedicated people. We want to make sure we mention them. And we also want to mention all the people who participated either as guest speakers or as interviewers. So before we close, I just want to mention uh, a, a huge thank you to Lanny Momsen, Nikki Marcano, Wendy Cloyd, Katie Wheeler, Rick Nelson, Maggie Winston, Lucy Oden, Sabrina Richman, Holly Yancey, Lacey Rodriguez, Rachel Robison, Colleen Peterson, Kim Champney, Garrett, Garrett Dominic, Travis Noah, Jenna and Tom Crafton, uh, Sydney Krebsbaugh, Heidi Lieb Williams, Anna Peeper, Anna Smith, Karen Brunello, Cynthia Hensley, Eric Gurley, Br Gwendolyn Bradshaw, Natalie Page, and the um, and Maggie Tibor, who just uh, we just heard from her, and of course we want to thank musicians Hannah Yoder and Kat Moore for performing, and special guest speakers this week Zach Gottsagen, Hannah and Shane, aka uh, Squirmy and Grubs, Micah Fialco Feldman, Lydia X Z Brown, Judy Human, Stand Up for Mental Health, Temple Grandin and Eric Hauk of Portugal, the man. That's everyone that hopefully if we missed your name, it's a huge, huge apologies in advance, but I think we got everybody and thank you for, for tuning in everybody. Jenna, you're gonna close us out. Our last, our last act to close out this very Pride Week will be recognizing people in Alaska who have gone above and beyond to support people with disabilities. Thank you to the Key Nine Disability Pride organizer for putting these awards together. Garrett is, Garrett is here to tell us who are nominees. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, I want to Thank everyone for participating and being the voice um, for uh, for your companions in the community that deserve the recognition for all their hard work. We consider this as advocacy. Sorry, uh, for being the voice for others. Over the past two weeks people from all around Alaska has done a survey for champions of disability pride. We want to thank all those people that have recognized their fellow friends, family, and acquaintances. These are the following nominees for the statewide community champion. Robert Nash from KP, myself from KP, Craig Fanning, KP, Laura Burroughs, KP. A lot of these are from KP, so I'll just skip that. Uh, Maggie Winston, Samantha Romig, Pete Sprague, the Sedona Mayor, Nikki Marcano, Darla Peterson, and then uh, from Anchorage, we have Ann Applegate, Rick Nelson, Mallory Hamilton. Those are it for the uh, statewide community champion. And following and after recognition, we will um, announce the winner. So hold on. <laughs> uh, the committee for disability pride wants to thank all the DSPs for their sacrifice during this time of need. The DSPs are the true heroes during this time. Thank you. These are the following nominees for the statewide DSP champion. Der Derek Evans, Brian Ormond, Michael Medley, Nikki Morcano, Caitlin Middleton, Furley McCoffey, uh, Kimberly Bruceman, Desiree Challens, Toby Hansen, Brett May, Kyle Chesitz, and Becca Petty. 
now we're moving on to the statewide recipient champion. The Committee for Disability Pride wants to thank all the recipients of Alaska for being shining stars during this epidemic. Without you strength strengthening your abilities, we will not be celebrating you. These are the following nominees for the statewide recipient champion. Corey Gilmore from Juno, myself. Matthew Marnelli, Catherine Flanders, Travis Noah, Gracie Satterlight, Rick Hunter, Rebecca Fiegel, Rick Nelson, Michelle Davidson, and Maggie Winston. Now I'll hand it over to Jenna. Thanks, uh, Garrett. We will now play a video for all for you to hear who is begin being be honored. And let's take a moment that give everybody a hand and make this event going on. And I want to give out a message that uh, empower yourself if you don't. If you get a message today from Tampa Grandin and Eric and everybody else, Malusians, I want you to take a time out of your life and uh, and say thank you and, and appreciate your disability and have a, a empower yourself to be a little bit better. And thanks for everybody. <laughs> thanks for coming to the Disability Pride the whole week. Thanks, Jenna. My name is Garrett Dominic. I'm I'm the chief marketing officer over at River Quest Group Home in Soldotna. I'm also known as a super advocate for the state of Alaska. Thank you very much, Jenna, and thank you for all your hard work this week. We appreciate it. My name is Nikki Marcano, and I'm an employment specialist on the Kenai Peninsula, helping people find jobs. I work for Frontier Community Services and I'm going on about 15 years. Garrett and I would like to take a moment to let you guys know a little bit about Champions. This idea started on the Kenai Peninsula and we're very excited and proud to have it carried on throughout the state of Alaska. The Disability Pride Celebration is a time for people with and without disabilities to recognize the great contributions to society that people with disabilities make every single day. The organizers have established the Disability Pride Champions Award to recognize and honor individuals, organizations, and businesses that exemplify the DD vision. The DD vision is that all Alaskans share a vision of a flexible system in which uh, each person directs their own supports based on their strengths and abilities toward a meaningful life in their home, their job, in their community. Whether it is through innovative ideas or a timeline of advocacy, the Champions of the Disability Pride Award recipient has contributed to making a positive difference for people with disabilities. Thank you again, Alaska. Congratulations to this award winner of the statewide community champion. This champion has went far and beyond to make sh to advocate for uh, recipients to make sure that they get the services that they need. This champion is known for her amazing and undiable work. So, let me introduce Ann Applegate, award winner for the statewide community champion. Congratulations. This is awesome. Thank you so much for selecting me as a champion. 
it's a privilege to be an ally. It's a privilege to do the work and watch people chart their own path and get the tools that they need and the information that they want and decide what a meaningful life looks like to them and go do it. So thank you for the opportunity to help with that. Thanks again. Bye bye everybody. This award goes to a direct support professional that has went beyond measures to embrace the shared vision, supporting person-directed services. Throughout the state of Alaska, the Shared Vision and Disability Pride recognizes Kim Brewson as an invaluable work for the direct support professionals in Alaska. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, yeah, thank you. I, just, I work with an awesome group of people and I have an amazing team. And I just, yeah, I think it's God because I, <laughs> so Amen. thank you. Thank you so much, Garrett and Nikki and everyone who have worked on Alaska's Virtual Disability Pride celebration this year. And thank you for the recognition for the shared vision work. I'm honored to receive it. Um, and I'm also feel privileged to be a part of this work that is not my work, but is the work of many, many people pouring countless hours, so much energy and passion and heart 
into making the lives of people with disabilities more um, ha uh, more meaningful and um, more um, open to the opportunities that all of us just take for granted. My life on a personal level has been enriched by the opportunity and it would again not be possible without so many people um, readily available when I send an email or pick up the phone and say hey can you do this or can you be part of this meeting and people jump and so while well, I um, thank you for the um, this uh, note of thanks I then in turn want to just celebrate um, what we can do when we all pull together and really believe in something um, so thank you all and let's keep it moving forward Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jenna, and um, thanks to Natalie and um, and Rachel and Garrett. Uh, we it's really been a great day. We're closing right on time, which is amazing for for the complicated show we had today. But uh, Jenna, do you want to say any last words? Uh, thanks for having me. I love being the uh, the host. It's really fun. And congratulations to Kim. And congratulations for Kim on your rewards and everybody in the category. <laughs> and um, empower yourself. That's the whole message about today. Empower yourself. Exactly. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Bye.